Sasuke isn't the only one in the world to live through the genocide of his clan. While he claims Naruto can never understand, what he fails to remember is that Naruto's clan, the Uzumaki clan, was also wiped out in times past by various other villages during one of the Great Ninja Wars, due to fear of their incredible powers and abilities. This left Kushina without a clan. Conversely, other Uzumaki, such as Nagato and his parents, as well as Karin and her parents, were forced to flee the village to survive. Kushina to Konohagakure, Nagato to Amegakure, and Karin to Kusagakure. It was during this time that Nagato would have his eyes replaced with Madara's Rinnegan, and Kushina would be forced to become the Nine Tails Jinchuriki out of tradition. Naruto was born without a history, and thanks to the views of the village, without a future, save for the one that he would carve for himself. But I wonder sometimes what would have happened if the Uzumaki clan had never been destroyed. Would life have been easier for Naruto? Would he have been happier? Would he feel like there was a place for him to belong? This is a line of thought I'd like to follow, so if you will, please join me as I weave a new story and see what might change with the Uzumaki clan's survival. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. So we all know that the Uzumaki clan was destroyed during one of the Great Ninja Wars. The nations feared their powerful sealing jutsu and so they all banded together to destroy them. All except for Konoha, who had been seen as a very close ally to the Uzumaki clan. It stands to wonder with me why Konoha didn't defend Uzoshiogakure if they were such great friends, especially knowing that they could have, with some of the most powerful and prestigious clans in the entire world centered in Konoha. They likely could have teamed up with the powerful sealing nation of Uzoshiogakure and slaughtered the opposing enemy forces, especially considering how close they were and how powerful each village was. It's always easier to defend than it is to attack, and opposing nations that plan to take a village always take far more casualties in war if modern tactics aren't used. So in this era where guns aren't even really a thing at the time, why was it that Uzo Shiogakure fell so easily? I think that it was merely because they were overwhelmed and had no reinforcements from anywhere. Likely this was a surprise attack, with neither Uzo Shiogakure or Konohagakure knowing about it until too late. But still, information is a living thing. So long as one person knows it, the knowledge can both live and spread. So let's say for a moment that during the course of the war, when the plan to eradicate the Uzumaki is formed, one thing leads to another, and word of the plan travels to the wrong people, who in turn inform both Uzoshio and Konoha. With this knowledge now theirs and the element of surprise on their side, Uzoshio begins to prepare, calling back troops from the war, fortifying their clan village, and having reinforcements from Konoha come to the village to aid in its defense. As the enemy prepares for their attack, they couldn't have known that their target both knew and was prepared. They believed this to be a secret strike, one plan to have them take the element of surprise and blitz the village without the village even knowing what was going on until it was too late. However, the village is now coordinated and expecting the attack, and Konoha is there to offer reinforcements to their ally. As the enemy shinobi rush in to take out what they see as an easy target, they're surprised to find that they can't even breach the village's defenses, as traps have been set and ballista are raining down arrows, kunai, and shuriken. The village's preparations are paying off, and not a single Uzumaki clan member is killed during the course of the fighting, and the enemy is hit so hard that their forces are decimated and they're forced to retreat. Not only does this result in the safeguarding of the village, but it also results in a huge hit to the opposing military forces, who are now having to tally the dead, deal with morale issues within their forces, and further bear the lack of skilled shinobi due to the loss of the many shinobi sent to take out the village. This would actually result in the Great Ninja Wars end at a much quicker pace. This leaves Uzoshiogakure in peace, and many people of the village would not be forced to leave to another village, which changes things up. The first thing to change is that Nagato never receives the Rinnegan from Madara. Instead, the Rinnegan are given to Kushina Uzumaki. The reasoning behind this would be her unusually high chakra prowess, which was considered high even for an Uzumaki, meaning she's a prime target. One day she'd wake up and she'd feel a pulsing pain in her eyes, not knowing why there was a burning sensation in the backs of them. She would look into the mirror one day and find the Rinnegan. 
This would be important as it would signify that she's destined for greatness, to be a god of creation and to bring balance to the world. And it is believed that she could be the child of prophecy, once spoken of by the great toad sages and the sage of six paths. She's sent to Konoha to become the Nine Tails Jinchuriki, which is only natural. While in Konoha, she begins to develop dreams. Dreams of being the Hokage and making the world a better place. However, she's bullied and picked on by the other kids due to her bright red hair and disgusting looking eyes. She tries not to show that it affects her, but deep down she feels upset because her eyes and hair are so different and weird. At some point in time, Kumogakure would attempt to capture her, hoping to take both the Ninetales and the Rinnegan for themselves. However, she is soon rescued by Minato, who comforts her by mentioning that he has always admired her long, flowing, fiery red hair and her beautiful and unique eyes, which are full of warmth and kindness. This causes Kushina to fall for Minato like a freaking stone. As time passes, the two get married and Kushina becomes pregnant with their firstborn child. After a nine-month period, that time to give birth has come. Now, Kushina is to be taken to a hidden location out of fear that she'll be kidnapped once more and the nine tails be stripped of her. The location is secret to all but a few people, including the third Hokage, his wife, all nurses and medical nin involved, and the Anbu. However, this knowledge is spread outside of the village by Tobi, who is planning how to manipulate events in his favor in a number of ways. Kumogakure is the nation to be manipulated as they both crave the Ninetales and the Rinnegan. Their strongest shinobi, likely their own version of the Anbu, go to the village to take the Leaf Anbu by surprise and make their way into the village to take Kushina while she's in labor. In doing so, they manage to take Naruto from her, who they plan to take back to the village to study the various techniques that the Uzumaki can do. They also manage to kill Minato by overwhelming him with a surprise attack, in which he also must fight while trying to keep Kushina's seal closed. This results in his death as well, leaving Kushina alone. Kushina would then proceed to release the power of her Rinnegan, killing every Kumonin in the room along with those outside as well. Unbeknownst to her, the shinobi that had escaped with her child, Naruto, have been intercepted by Tobi, who kills the shinobi and takes the child from them. Tobi, remembering his mentor, Minato, decides to do one good thing out of respect for him, and takes Naruto to Uzoshiogakure and leaves him abandoned on a stoop, planning to make it seem as though he has been killed, but not shown to have been. Kushina is left with nothing. Her child is taken and likely killed, and Minato is dead. Her friend, Biwako Sarutobi, is dead and she's left alone. Embittered and depressed, Kushina considers taking her own life, regardless of what happens to the Ninetales. That is until a strange masked man appears before her. He would introduce himself as a hidden benefactor who wants what's best for the world. He would tell Kushina that he had attempted to rescue her child, but that in the moments before he could retrieve it, the Kumonen killed it out of spite. This causes Kushina to cry out in sorrow, taking up in her hands one of the Anbu blades, planning to commit seppuku as she doesn't wish to live in a world without Minato and Naruto. That's when she's stopped by Tobi, who informs her that he can help her create a world in which Naruto and Minato still exist. In awe, she's led to the Uchiha clan monument through Kamui and is allowed to read the text, which is deciphered for her by the Rinnegan. She begins to understand the infinite Tsukiyomi, which Tobi describes as a world so real that one might believe it was indeed real a world where she can do whatever she wishes and have whatever she desires. Best of all, she can give this same gift to everyone. A world without death. A world without war and loss. No losers. A world where there are only winners, love, and happiness. In her emotional state, Kushina would quickly accept this, as she needs some hope and stability to hold on to, lest she slip back into depression and disembowel herself. She would join Toby and adopt the moniker Pain, as she has known only that since that day in October. Now that we have our backstory set up, we need to do a little world building right quick to uncover what happens in the world due to this massive paradigm shift. First off, Nagato is never in Amegakure and thus his family is never killed. This means that Conan and Yahiko are the only ones left. Due to this, they never meet Jiraiya and are never trained by him. Instead, they are attacked by an Iwa Chunin and killed, another tragedy in this war. Jiraiya returns home to the village alongside the Sanin and remains there. The Akatsuki in its first iteration is never created, though Tobi ensures that their iteration of the Akatsuki is formed, possibly under a new name, probably Gesekai. The Uchiha are never blamed for the Ninetales attack, especially since there was no attack, meaning that the Uchiha are not killed and instead remain alive. Given the lack of Naruto and the Ninetales, the Land of Waves arc either doesn't happen or ends in failure. And now, back to our story. Naruto is raised in Uzoshiogakure under adoptive parents Aoi and Gi Uzumaki. 
Aoi is his mother and Ji is his father. He lives a normal life as any child would, but he would be quick to join the academy for training. There, he meets a young girl around his age named Karin, who is both smart and powerful, though she seems to ignore him for the most part. Naruto has a little trouble with learning much of the things taught here, but he is capable of learning various other jutsu, including forming adamantine chains. Of course, his chains are weak due to his young age, but it shows promise and is proof of his Uzumaki clan lineage, which had been questionable due to him not possessing the same red hair as they had. He would, after failing a few times, manage to pass the academy exam and graduate to become a Ganyan of Uzoshiogakure. To that end, he's placed on a shinobi team along with Karin Uzumaki and another boy, who I'm going to name Tenku. Tenku Uzumaki. Tenku is a strong Uzumaki clan child, whose main power comes in the form of adamantine chains which he uses to bind others. Despite being a shinobi, he is a pacifist by nature to the point of being vegetarian. His nindo is to be a proper shinobi without the need to kill, which is why he focuses heavily on sealing jutsu, as it's a perfect way to pacify an enemy without killing them. Together, the three are placed under their jonin, Nagato Uzumaki, who is a strong yet slightly timid man with a kind heart, but powerful darkness that rests in his heart to use as a weapon against those who would threaten his village. For the most part, they merely train and do odd jobs in Uzushio, until such a time as the leader of Uzushio commands them to fulfill the task of delivering a special scroll with a special sealing formula in it to Kusagakure, where it would be used to add an extra layer of protection to Hozuki Castle in order to ensure that none can escape further. This seal will stir the waters around the blood prison that cause dangerous whirlpools to form around it, ensuring that should the event occur that somehow there is a prison break, no prisoners can get off the island without drowning in the turbulent waters. To that end, Team Nagato is sent to deliver the sealing scroll to the warden of Hozuki Castle, Mui. While there though, one of the chief officers, Benga, undoes the fire-style heavenly prison seal on a prisoner named Sukiyo in an attempt to help him escape in exchange for personal gain. He attempts to escape the prison, and Team Nagato are requisitioned by Mui to recover the Mujina bandit. However, upon finding him, they discover that he is actually the Mujina bandit's leader, Shojoji who had used the corpse clone technique to transform into his subordinate in an effort to keep his reputation clear. Team Nagato begin to fight him, though his prowess with wind release makes it fairly difficult to break through his defenses, and his lightning release abilities make it hard to defend against him as well. In an effort to end the battle, Nagato takes the scroll out and tosses it into the sea, where the formula activates and surrounds the castle in whirlpools. Nagato then coordinates with his three students and begins using their adamantine chains in an attempt to capture Shojoji, but the bandit leader is unwilling to return to the castle and chooses instead to plunge into the currents below, drowning himself. Mui would thank them for their help, and Benga would then rejoin the blood prison, but this time as a prisoner instead of an officer, and Team Nagato returned to Uzushiogakure. There, they are commended for their good work, and because they were capable of beating a powerful shinobi such as Shojoji, they are recommended by Nagato and the leader of Uzushio to join the Chunin exams being held in Konoha. Naruto, Karin, and Tenku with great joy accept their chance to further their careers and head towards the village with their mentor to enter, looking around at all the sights. Nagato, who had been in this village on multiple occasions during his time as an envoy to Konoha, would take them to the best places to get food around the village, and they would enjoy themselves before signing up for the Chunin exams. Now, when the written test comes around, Naruto has about as hard of a time as normal, and Karin would actually manage to do pretty well. Of course, Tenku is a brick who can barely be called literate and doesn't even know where to sign his name, let alone answer any questions. Naruto hasn't even answered a single question on the test. Instead, he's compulsively scratching the side of his head with his pencil, as if he's trying to remove the stupid in his brain with the eraser. Time is up, and he hasn't even answered a single question, but question 10 is designed specifically to be an all-or-nothing question, in which if they get it right, they'll have enough points to pass. But if they get it wrong, they'll never be able to try out for Chunin rank again, and will always remain Genin. Karin is confused by this, but she knows for certain that Konoha doesn't control who becomes Chunin or not, and she knows that Uzoshio would never go for it, so she calls the bluff by taking the question anyway. Naruto is gutsy enough to do it, and Tenku is terrified, and considered dropping out of the test right then and there, not certain he could answer it even if it was as simple as 2 plus 2. The pressure is really getting to him, and he's resisting the urge to pee himself as he recognizes that the rest of the team has decided to take the question, and is counting on him to take it as well. Terrified to the point that he might puke, he decides to take it anyway to be a reliable member of the team, and in turn, he is rewarded for his bravery as every shinobi who takes the test is passed immediately for showing grit in the face of irreversible damage to their lives and careers. 
Naruto, who hadn't answered a single question, meets up with his team with a smile and they all congratulate each other for passing. Team 7 also passes. This consists of Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Harano, and another boy named Ryu Koga. Moving on to the Forest of Death, their mission is to guard the Earth Scroll and then get a Heaven Scroll, as well as getting to the Colosseum in the center to pass. At first, the mission goes rather smoothly. That is, until they encounter the Sand Siblings, nearly out of the gate, who possess a Heaven Scroll. They begin their fight, but the inexperienced Team Nagato is overwhelmed by the Sand Siblings, who would manage to not only take their Earth Scroll, but wound Tenku pretty badly. He's left on the ground in pain and dying. Kareen convinces Naruto to give up the scroll to save his life, stating that she can save him, but Naruto needs to give up the scroll. Begrudgingly, Naruto gives it up as a means to barter protection for his team, which the Sand Siblings allow. They move the screaming Tenku to a safer location where they stabilize his wound. Meanwhile, Naruto is in the nearest tallest tree at the very top, looking out over the rest of the forest. He notices some fighting in one direction. At first, a massive snake, and then a large pillar of violet chakra shooting into the sky. He decides to avoid that and heads in another direction. As they do, they manage to work together and take the scrolls from two other shinobi teams. They then rush off to the center of the forest to the arena and are passed with flying colors, though Tenku's wounds being a broken ankle cause him to drop out of the next set of exams to heal. Instead, he pulls for Karin and Naruto. Team Kakashi also seems to pass, though it seems that their comrade Ryukoga has been eaten by a snake and has perished. Sakura laments this and Kakashi considers pulling his team out of it due to the emotional and physical trauma, but a defiant Sasuke refuses and after having his curse mark removed by Itachi, he's cleared to continue the fight. Sakura seems to be in worse shape emotionally and also chooses to drop out of the exams. Sasuke would easily beat his opponent Yoroi and Naruto would beat Kiba with his special strategies. The battle between Karin and Ino comes around and amazingly Karin comes out on top as she has more varied abilities including her adamantine chains which are far easier to use than that mind body switch technique that Ino uses. Not to mention that Sakura has very few jutsu and still managed to fight it to a stalemate. At this point, I feel that our version of Karin would be above Ino and Sakura and so she moves on. They would get a month off for training and during that time Naruto would run into Jiraiya, though nothing really happens as Jiraiya doesn't know Naruto from Adam. He thinks that Kushina's baby is dead and Naruto does not have the Ninetales. There's no reason why they would train together. As badly as I want Naruto to learn Rasengan, there is no reason that he would at this time, so he's gonna have to settle for using the multi-shadow clone jutsu as his main. Naruto trains with Nagato for a time, but there's not much Nagato could teach Naruto in the way of combat, as Nagato was what you might call a sensory type ninja, whose abilities specifically center around finding people as opposed to fighting. But he does have a few tips and tricks he wished to show off, and one of these tricks he remembered after watching Ten Ten's battle. He offers to teach Naruto how to use summoning, and so he offers him scrolls, telling him that if he forms a contract with a beast, he can summon it. Furthermore, he can store any type of weapon he can think of within these scrolls, and the moment he needs them, all he needs to do is open the scroll, and there it'll be. He says that scrolls offer a ninja plenty of advantages, and few shinobi specialize in it, meaning that he has the advantage. Naruto asks him why he's teaching them this, as the last person to use this type of technique got stomped by Tamari. Nagato would say that Naruto isn't Tenten. He says that he has a different way of thinking, and he may be able to use it to come out on top. He further states that Naruto's next opponent, Neji Hyuga, focuses on the close-range aspect of combat, while Naruto needs to focus on long-range. If he can stay out of Neji's range, Naruto should be safe, and capable of bringing Neji down. Naruto takes this and begins to train with it. He would then return to the arena for the next round of fights where he, much like before, would be pitted against Neji Hyuga. Naruto steps out with a large scroll and Neji seems angered by this as if Naruto is mocking his teammate. Naruto would wait for the battle to begin. As Neji comes at him, Naruto utilizes his Shadow Clone technique to get far enough away and begin to pelt Neji with attacks designed to weaken him. But Neji utilizes the Palm Rotation technique and manages to defend himself. As time continues to move on, Naruto would discover Neji's weak point, and so he manages to form many Shadow Clones to surround and confuse Neji. They would attack from different directions until Naruto himself manages to sneak around to the back and use a Shadow Clone to throw him at high speeds towards his target. Naruto would make contact and knock Neji into the wall, defeating him. Sasuke would be up next to fight Gara, and just like before, he manages to win when he pierces Gara's defenses with the Chidori. The battle afterward would have been between Kankoro and Karin, to which Karin was dying to get vengeance on him for hurting Tenku, but the battle is put to a stop when there's an attack, and the exams are interrupted. 
Kabuto puts everyone to sleep with his genjutsu, including Team Nagato, who remains asleep for the duration of the attack. Sasuke and Sakura end up going to fight Gara, but Gara transforms and gains a power-up which allows him to overpower Sasuke and Sakura, killing them. Orochimaru also manages to murder the Hokage. After this, Team Nagato are recalled to Uzushio after the attack, and are tasked to send condolences on behalf of the village to Konoha over the death of their leader. Danzo Shimura is installed as the next Hokage after Jiraiya fails to save Tsunade, and she dies. Time passes, though, when eventually Team Nagato are able to become Chunin. Uzushio Gakure would also aid in the mission to retrieve Gara from the Akatsuki with the help of Team Gai. They manage to get there after the Tailed Beast is removed from Gara, but they manage to stop them from escaping with it, and after defeating both Deidara and Sasori, Uzoshio Gakure is tasked by Danzo to safeguard the One Tail, which they do. They would then aid Konoha by sending out their shinobi to help defeat Hidan and Kakuzu after they manage to murder Asuma. While they are in control of the One Tail, crap really hits the fan when Pain decides to handle things personally. She would make her way to Uzoshio Gakure, her former home, and would set about to attack it. Nagato would fight alongside many other warriors against her, but her raw power and use of the Rinnegan is mind-boggling, and even Nagato would perish in battle, along with Karin and Tenku. Naruto is the only one left, and he attempts to fight her, but finds himself heavily outmatched. As he attempts to use his weapon summoning, she instead utilizes the Ashura Path to knock it all out of the way. She would then use the Diva Path to ragdoll Naruto, demanding to know where the One Tail is. Naruto refuses to tell her and in the end is run through with black chakra rods. Naruto would lay on the ground, gurgling in his own blood. Kushina would begin to leave as she was looking for her target, but she stops when she senses something from the black rods. The receivers she used for her six paths of pain were the same as these receivers, which meant that she felt the chakra, and this chakra felt familiar. Too familiar. She looked back at him with shock on her face and ran over to him. N Naruto? Naruto! He would look up at her with shock as tears dripped from her eyes down to his cheek. She finally realized that the boy she had been fighting against, the boy that she just killed, was her own son that she had lost so many years earlier. As he fell limp, his eyes closed, and she began to wail, knowing that what she had hoped to create through a world of dreams already existed, and she had just killed it. She also began to believe that she had been betrayed by Toby. Once again, the desire to die reached her mind as she realized what she had done, but this time she was certain she would go through with it, but not specifically because she wanted to die, but because she wanted him to live. She would then lay her son down, removing the chakra rods from his chest and stomach before unleashing the outer path Samsara of Heavenly Life technique. Suddenly, behind her, the King of Hell's head appeared and would begin to spit out the souls of all those she had killed, including Naruto. Naruto would open his eyes and look to Kushina, who would pull him in close. Naruto would be confused about what had happened to him and why she had brought him back to life. She began to explain her story to him and what she had desired, realizing now that it was wrong. She revealed her parenthood to him, but this could not last. She had used a technique that would ultimately kill her, and so, as her hair turned white, the vitality of her body stolen from her, she charged her son to defeat Toby and stop the birth of the Ten Tails. To cement his duty, she would then transfer Kurama to his body. She would pull him in for one last embrace and kiss him on the cheek, letting her last words be, I am sorry, before passing on. Naruto would take her words to heart. He would be hailed as a hero of Uzushio Gakure. Naruto would then inform Danzo about the threat on its way, and a Kage summit would be called to discuss the matter. Meanwhile, Tobi appeared and took the Rinnegan for himself. A war was declared when Konoha and Kuma refused to turn over the nine, eight, and one-tailed beasts, and Naruto was sent to the island to hide with Killer B. However, he made a point of reminding them that he did have control over the Nine-Tails Chakra through his usage of his incredible chakra reserves, as well as his Tori Gate Sealing Jutsu, which had allowed him to take over the Nine-Tails energy for himself. Furthermore, he stated that so long as the enemy didn't have all the tailed beasts, everything would be fine. To that end, they instead would send the scroll sealing Shukaku to the island with Killer B for safekeeping. However, unknown to them, both the scroll and part of the eight tails would be stolen by Kisame Hoshigaki, who would deliver them to Tobi and would then use them to revive the ten tails, becoming its Jinchuriki. At this point, nobody could stop him. Jiraiya had managed to prove that sage techniques could harm him, but was not nearly strong enough to actually defeat him. This resulted in the allied shinobi forces nearly being defeated. But when all looked bleak and Naruto was about to die, he would be saved by Tenku, who would take him to Kareen, who would manage to restore his body with her ability to heal through being bitten. During this time, Naruto is visited by the spirit of the Sage of Six Paths, who grants him the Six Paths Chakra needed to stand up against Obito. 
Naruto would then use this power and strip Obito of the Ten Tails, sealing it away inside of himself using his own adamantine chains. He was nearly ripped apart by it, but his incredible reserves managed to make up for it. Obito would perish without the Ten Tails. Black Zetsu would attempt to attack Naruto, but the combined sealing power of Karin and Tenku would catch him off guard. From here, peace returns until Teneri attempts to destroy the world. In response, Naruto is sent to the moon to face off against him as the Ten Tails Jinchuriki. And with his overwhelming might, Naruto manages to succeed in doing just that, bringing Teneri back to the light. After this, Naruto would return home and focus on his budding romance with Karin, who he later marries. They have one child together that Naruto names Kushina out of respect for his mother. This child is born with Six Paths Chakra, namely the Rinnegan, due to descending from her father who now possesses the Rinne Sharingan. When Momoshiki and Kinshiki appear, they are no match against Naruto as the Ten Tails Jinchuriki, and the same is true of Ishiki when he returns for his vengeance. In fact, Naruto becomes known as the strongest shinobi in history, and is venerated as much as the Sage of Six Paths. And just like before, when his time comes that he should perish, he would separate the tailed beasts into nine creatures and set them free. And that's how I assume it would go. It was really interesting to me to explore this side of things. I was caught between giving the Rinnegan to Kushina or Nagato still originally, and I wasn't sure which way to take things. I wondered if Madara would choose Nagato if there were still that many Uzumaki left. In the end, it was my belief that Madara would choose the strongest Uzumaki, and as it turns out, in that current generation, it was Kushina. In fact, she was sent to become the Ninetales Jinchuriki due to having high chakra, even for an Uzumaki, who each naturally have high chakra reserves. When it comes to her fall to darkness though, I needed to make it feel natural. I couldn't just have Toby rush in there and kill everyone. I didn't think he would do so anyway. If Kushina had both the Rinnegan and the strongest tailed beast, that would make her the most important piece of the Eye of the Moon plan. But what do you think? Do you see anything happening differently? If so, tell us what you think in the comments below. Did you enjoy our video? Well then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.